This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by lynda.com, the unparalleled online video training library. For a free 10-day unlimited trial, visit lynda.com slash macvoices. And by the Mac Voices Dispatch, our weekly newsletter, to stay up to date on all the Mac Voices news. Subscribe from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the Talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, it's that time of year when we get a new Mac OS again. This time it will be El Capitan. And to help us get up and running with El Capitan safely, making the transition from Yosemite or whatever you happen to be running, is Mr. Joe Kissel. He is the author of the new Take Control of Upgrading to El Capitan. Joe, it's great to see you. It seems like we've done one or two of these before. I think we might have um, maybe maybe quite a few of them. Uh, in fact, you know, it's it's really surprising to me that that we should be doing this. Um, if you'd asked me a year ago, would I be, you know, talking about a, a book about upgrading to the next version of OS X today? I probably would have put the odds at less than fifty percent, because from my point of view, OS X upgrades have gotten kind of boring. I mean, they're they're free. You go to the app store, you click a button, and more or less, that's it usually for most people, hopefully. Uh, a few little qualifications in there. Um, and, you know, the last few updaters have been, the last few versions of OS X, the, the installer part, ha have been very similar to each other. So if you've done this before with Yosemite or with Mavericks, there's probably not a whole lot that's different. So every year, I have this conversation with Adam and Tony. I say, well, do, do people really need another book on upgrading? If they've done it before, they probably know what they're doing by now. Do they really need another book? And so Adam and Tony say, well, let's let's take a look at some statistics. Let's look at our sales. And they'll say, well, you know, you sold however many thousand copies of the book last year. So apparently last year, thousands of people still felt they needed this advice. If you're going to sell thousands of copies of a book, why not? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I say, well, okay, then I guess I'll do it again. And you know, maybe at some point, um, the sales will drop off to the point where it's like, well, you know, 500 people bought the book last year. It's probably not worth the effort to do another one this year. But we haven't gotten to that point yet. A lot of people still feel uh, like they need some help and guidance and advice and uh, a bit of hand-holding, and that's fine. I'm happy to do that because, boy, have I installed uh, Mac OS X a lot, uh, especially El Capitan. You know, in some ways, I'm not really surprised at, at this, simply because making that transition is, is a bit of a big deal. Apple has done a great job of trying to make it very smooth, and for the most part, they have made it smooth, especially if you will just observe a few a few simple caveats. On the other hand, when it goes wrong, it can be kind of devastating um, because now your production environment is shut down. Maybe your Mac is shut down completely. Right. And so I, th I personally think it's a pretty sound investment uh, in, in getting a book like this and, and basically hiring you to shepherd me through it since you have right. done all those installs of El Capitan. Right. I, I have probably seen or at least heard about pretty much any kind of weird, surprising thing that might happen. Um, I was chatting with, uh, over email with, with Michael Cohen, uh, last week, he, he got a new Mac and he was installing El Capitan and he actually had a, a power outage during his installation, which of course screwed everything up. That's, that's a scenario I have not personally tested. I have not tried yanking the plug, uh, during an installation. Um, he was able to recover. Everything was fine, but, um, you know, stuff stuff does happen. So I, I've tried to account for as as many as many of those possibilities as I reasonably can, and uh, sort of, you know, I, I tell you what might surprise you in advance, so that you're not really surprised, and you can take appropriate steps to deal with it, you know, prepare for it, or or fix the problem. So before we dig into the appropriate steps, 
Let's talk about how this book has been released. What, because depending on when people see or hear this, it may be in its first version. It may be in the 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 one point one version. Right. So we're doing with this book uh, what we've done for the past uh, few versions of OS ten. Uh, version 1.0 of the book came out in early September, and uh, that was a comparatively short book. And it talks about all the things you should be doing in advance of the release of El Capitan to get ready. Um, make sure you've gotten rid of, you know, excess clutter and updated your apps and done backups and those good sorts of things that we can talk about later. Um, then uh, on September 30th, uh, if the gods are smiling on us. Uh, version 1.1 of the book will come out. And version 1.1 of the book adds, you know, sort of doubles in length. And uh, it tells you not only what to do to prepare, but also what to do from that moment on, from the time you download the installer and all the questions you'll have to ask and the things you'll have to do afterwards. So um, we, we, we do it this way for two reasons. One reason is that even though... <laughs> millions of people have been testing the beta and uh, information about it is extremely public. Technically, according to the letter of the law, nobody should be talking about it because of Apple's NDA. And uh, we, we want to remain friends with Apple. So we, we try to hew as closely to that as we reasonably can. Um, but the second and really more important reason is that Apple very often changes stuff between the very late betas, the very late uh, gold master candidates, and the final release. So on, on you know Friday morning the 30th when uh, El Capitan is released, I will instantly jump on it, download it, install it on all of my Macs, and very carefully you know, follow my own steps and make sure that nothing has changed that would make what I've already written invalid. I mean, the book is written, edited, totally ready to go. But we, we want to just wait to release it until we have seen for ourselves that we're still telling you the truth and that nothing uh, out of the, you know, nothing unexpected has come up. Uh, and if it does, we will make our little last minute edits. There, there are always a few. We'll do our very, very best to get the book out, the 1.1 version of the book out on September 30th. Um, how quickly we're able to do that depends on what surprises we encounter on that day. Uh, hopefully it'll be a very smooth process. And of course, anyone who has bought the book already will get that update for free. Uh, now, if you happen to be watching or listening to this before September 30th, and you're thinking about buying the book, this would be a really good time because uh, the, the cover price is $15, but we're selling it for $10 if you buy it beforehand, and we'll raise the price on release date to 15. Um, you can still get either way, you can still get discounts by buying bundles and things like that. But, uh, but you can save a few bucks by buying it earlier. I'm glad you got that second part in because I want to make sure we touched on that. So I have a confession. When iOS 9 came out, I installed it within about 15 minutes, mm -hmm. which is a foolhardy kind of thing to do. Uh, it just is, folks. Sorry. So I, I've, I've going to suggest that people maybe wait again a day, two days, maybe three days. Let you make those final edits to the book. See if there are any problems that have come up. Probably not, but just in case. Um, now, having said that, you know that there are plenty of people that are not going to do that. Sure. In fact, I'm probably one of them. So what, uh, what would you recommend that we do? to get ready for El Capitan so that if we do give in to that temptation, we're okay. Uh, okay, so a few things. For, first of all, I want to say, you know, having having gone through many, many, many OS X upgrades over the years, um, my, my impression of El Capitan is, is very positive. It's been extremely stable for me. Um, I am uh, using it full-time on one of my Macs over here. And um, it, it's been good. Um, there, there were some, you know, some speed bumps in the, in the uh, transition process. There always are. That's no big deal. But I haven't seen any crashes or major deal breakers. Um, not, nothing that makes me go, ooh, you know, I really wish I could go back to Yosemite. Nothing like that. So um, I, I do think that Apple has really benefited from this public beta testing process that helps them to make a better product. And I also think that because the 
the visible changes in El Capitan are not that big a deal. There aren't many, you know, big flashy marquee features. It's really sort of just, it's a lot of bug fixes, actually, and a lot of performance improvements um, that really shows. So this isn't sort of your typical 1.0 release. Having said that, um, ha having said that I, I really, I've tested the waters and I think they're safe, um, there are some things that everyone, including me, should always do before, uh, before upgrading to OS X. So one of, the, one of the things, of course, is uh, backup. <laughs> Um, and of course, you know, we've talked about backups endlessly with something like uh, an, an OS 10 upgrade, you, you really want to make sure you have a clone, a bootable duplicate. So even if you use time machine or crash plan or something else to back up your Mac, also, um, use something like carbon copy cloner or super duper to make a complete file for file, perfect uh, copy of your, of your disc on an external hard drive. And you do that for for a couple of reasons. And the biggest reason at this moment is that if something goes wrong, either during the upgrade process, like power goes out, or uh, immediately after, like you, you discover, much to your dismay, that there's a, a major, major bug that affects you or a software incompatibility that you didn't realize, some app that you really, really rely on just doesn't work under uh, El Capitan, something of that sort, and you're like, oh no, I have to go back. Well, there, there's no uninstall feature. There's no revert to previous OS X feature in the installer. Apple does not provide a way for you to do that. The only way to do that is to wipe off your disk and restore everything from a recent complete backup. And your bootable duplicate can, can serve that purpose for you. So I'm a big advocate of uh, duplicates before upgrading. Um, I also really strongly recommend that to the extent possible, you update all of your apps before upgrading OS X. <clears throat> there will be some compatibility issues, and you'll have a much better experience if your apps are already compatible with El Capitan before you upgrade, as opposed to you upgrade, you try an app, and oh, it crashes, or it doesn't work, or you know, it's moved to your incompatible software folder, or whatever. Um, and then you got to go sort out the problem later. It's just an easier and smoother experience if you update your apps, your preference panes, your menu extras, all that stuff beforehand, um, mail plugins, things like that. Um, so if, if you do nothing else, and of course the book recommends a lot of other things you could do, those two things, uh, a backup, a great bootable duplicate, and uh, making sure your software is up to date will really, really help you. Just something, it, it strikes me something we've never talked about, I don't think, and, and I don't definitely don't believe in relation to this. Let's just say that I have my bootable duplicate sitting here and something goes wrong with my El Capitan install. Do I need to wipe my, my drive and do a full, in, full recover, or can I do a reverse incremental clone and put it back to the way it was? Did okay, I say that right? So um, more or less, yeah. Okay. So um, the, here's what I would do personally. Um, the first thing I would do is is just try again, like literally just restart my Mac and see if the installer picks up where it left off, because very often it will. It, it's not a 100% guarantee, but Apple has made its installer pretty smart. And in most situations, if there is some sort of an error during the upgrade process, merely restarting uh, will kick it back into gear, and it will finish. So try that first. You have nothing to lose. Um, the second thing I would try is start up from the clone and do what you say, an incremental uh, update of the, of the, uh, the you know, the, the indeterminate volume, the volume you were trying to install a Capitan onto. Um, these apps like Carbon Copy Cloner and Super Duper are pretty smart. Um, and so... Um, what what should happen during you know when you clone your your clone back onto the internal drive is that it only copies the changed pieces um, and that will be much much faster than copying over everything and it'll still give you basically the same result uh, only if that failed would I say okay go ahead and wipe the drive and start over completely from scratch 
Um, there are certain situations in which that could happen, especially if there is disk damage of some sort or, or directory errors, um, just something that, that merely recopying the files won't solve. But those situations are comparatively rare. Okay. I, I kind of thought that because it's it's not a lot different if you just flip it around. Uh, at some point, you're going to be ready to give up your, your clone of your Yosemite install, and I'm going to run one of those, and they're going to do an incremental copy of my El Capitan install, just copying over the new stuff. So Right. But, you, you know, you, you put me in mind of something else, though, which is... Let's say you normally, you, you, you make clones all the time, like you have it set on a schedule to, to clone your hard drive every day, which is a really smart thing to do. So um, once you upgrade uh, to El Capitan, your, your scheduled clone is still going to run. But maybe you don't want it to. Maybe you want to turn off those scheduled updates to your clone for, you know, two or three days, something like that. Um, because... As soon as that scheduled update has has written over your, let's say, Yosemite clone with El Capitan, well, then you can no longer go back. So you want to make sure that you've used El Capitan long enough that you've gotten to try everything out. You've tried all of your apps. You've um, made sure all the all the things that you depend on work for you. And once you are confident that everything is as it should be, then you can update your clone. But it is it is a slightly scary step in that. At that moment, unless you have you know yet another clone that you've just you know reserved, at that moment you are erasing your capability to go back. So you you want to be a little bit careful about that. This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Lynda.com, the unparalleled online video training library. Get a full free ten day trial at Lynda.com/MacVoices. If you're a Mac Voices listener or viewer. It's a pretty safe bet that we share some characteristics. You like to learn, to keep up with what's new and interesting in the tech field and beyond. That you are tech savvy to one degree or another. That you want to be more productive and probably need to be more productive, either for yourself or for your vocation. We all have our secret weapons that keep us afloat and ahead of the competition. I'm happy to say that lynda.com is a key piece of my arsenal. No one can learn everything about everything, no matter how hard we try, because tomorrow, next week, or next month, there's even more of everything. If I can learn something from an expert, why would I want to waste precious time trying to figure it out for myself? Lynda.com has experts in a wide variety of subjects, tech and non-tech, who will help you learn what you need to learn fast and efficiently, and at your own pace. Say that you need to get up to speed on Google Apps for the office, or want to learn how to work with Camera Raw in Photoshop Creative Cloud or are interested in learning about entrepreneurship from someone like the one and only Guy Kawasaki. Those are just a few of the recent courses that lynda.com has published. And I mean just a few, because there are all sorts of videos to help you learn about the general concepts of a topic, or the down and dirty details. You can try all of this for a free full 10 days by signing up at lynda.com slash macvoices. During that 10 days, you can watch whatever you want, as much as you want, on any subject you want. No restrictions, no limitations. Try a design course, then a spreadsheet course, then a web publishing course. You pick the topics that suit you, not some limited subset of the collection of over 3,500 courses on lynda.com. Please, do something nice for yourself right now by signing up for 10 days free at lynda.com slash macvoices. Then let me know what you decided to watch. Maybe we can trade recommendations. I'm on Twitter as at Chuck Joyner, and I want to hear from you. One last time, lynda.com slash macvoices for a free 10-day trial. Do it now, you won't regret it. Thanks to lynda.com for their support of Mac Voices. Joe, any tips um, on, on updating the apps that you mentioned? We all, we all know, I, at least I hope that most people know, that if you upgrade it in the App Store, it's a pretty easy thing. Just go back to the App Store, look in the Update section, and you'll, you'll download but there are plenty of apps that we all have, many of us have, especially legacy apps uh, that were bought before the App Store, or we have apps that do things that the App Store doesn't approve of, and therefore, you know, we have to figure it out. Any right. any software that helps automate that, or is it just a painstaking process of doing it one at a time? Well, what I what I do personally is I just you know every time I use an app, <coughs> excuse me, I. 
I check its preferences to see if there is an automatic update feature and I turn it on. Um, most most apps these days do have built-in software update features, and so if they do, I turn them on. Uh, and most of the time, uh, merely launching the app will cause it to check for updates. So um, th there are there are other ways of approaching it, but that's that's what I do. Okay, that's and, and I would think most of them, like you say, they they default to on, or they give you the option at first launch to turn it on. And even though it seems like there are times you just get get inundated with these updates. Um, these this is the time that it's going to be a good thing for you, right? Yeah. Any other any other gotchas or anything else that you think we should be particularly paying attention to as we go through this process? So um, a lot of people have probably heard by now of this new OS X security feature called System Integrity Protection, and this is basically Apple's way of locking down certain sensitive parts of your disks so that uh, you're you're more protected from malware and hijacking and things. So that, that's a very good thing. It makes it much harder for an attacker to you know write files in the wrong places or to take control of your Mac. So that's great. But this new feature has some implications. And one of the implications is that some of your existing apps and utilities will need to be updated. Uh, for example, default folder currently at this mo at the moment I'm saying this does not work uh, unless you turn off the security feature, which you really should not do. And uh, they're saying we will have a version that works with it, but patience. Um, other developers are saying, you know, due to the security changes in El Capitan, we, we just can't work at all. And one of those is menu meters, which makes me very sad because I love menu meters. Um, so you will have to be aware of a few things like that, and and a lot of your software, like you know Carbon Copy Cloner and and Crash, uh, not Crash Mine, uh, Super Duper, will need updates to work properly with this new uh, system. But there are some other implications. Um, one of those implications is if you use the command line and you are used to using the sudo or sudo command s u d o um, to give yourself. The, the power to change any file anywhere on your Mac, you no longer have that power. I mean, you can still use sudo, but it doesn't work quite everywhere. There are a few directories, such as the uh, the slash bin, the slash s bin, the slash usr uh, or user directory, or most parts of that directory that are now protected, and you can no longer make changes to them. Um, so what this means is that if you've used, if you've installed your own Unix software on the command line, uh, you might have to not just update it, but also relocate it, move it to a place that is no longer, uh, that is not protected because in the upgrade process, Apple actually erases uh, anything in those specific directories that, that it didn't put there itself. Um, Mail plugins are always a thing you have to worry about uh, when you're upgrading. And again, at this precise moment that we're doing this interview, uh, one of my favorite mail plugins is not yet compatible with El Capitan. That's GPG Mail for uh, for doing encryption. Uh, the developer says we're real close, <laughs> um, but uh, but the version I have now actually causes uh, mail to crash in El Capitan. So um, you know, just have to check on those things and make sure you have up-to-date versions. Um, I'm just looking down sort of my, my list of, uh, my list of other surprises. Uh, oh, here, here's one that's going to surprise a lot of people. Uh, disk utility has changed. Uh, it's completely different. It looks absolutely nothing like the way it did before. And probably the most surprising change in disk utility is that it no longer has a repair disk permissions command. That's because it doesn't need it anymore. Because of this system integrity protection, um, it is vastly harder than it used to be for for permissions to go out of whack in the first place. And even if they do, every time you run Apple's installer, uh, it fixes them for you. So as a consequence, uh, repairing disk permissions is no longer a thing. You can't do it, but don't worry. You don't need to do it. It's fine. Uh, another thing that you may be surprised to see is missing in the finder is the secure empty trash command. Um, I, I have not, I mean, I, I, I've 
had a lot of discussions with this about other people in the take control world, and a lot of theories have been bandied about as to why Apple might have removed this command, but nobody actually knows for sure. It's surprising to me, and it's a bit mysterious. Um, so uh, until I know more, all I can really say is that if you want to securely uh, erase files and you're not using File Vault, File Vault sort of makes it irrelevant, but if you if you aren't using File Vault and you want to securely erase files, you might have to go find a third-party utility that will do that for you. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of other smaller changes, like some different gestures and some changes the way two-factor authentication is set up and things like that. Oh, new a new spinning pizza of death. You know, the... the oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the, the beach ball, the, the pinwheel. Uh, it's... It's now flat. It's no longer the the sort of convex uh, lollipop shape. It's it's flat now. So, when when an application is hung up, at least it <laughs> at least it'll be hung up in a flat way. I don't. Know. So, <laughs> Johnny Ive strikes again. Yeah, the spinning pizza of death looks different. But um, but you know on the so there you know there are some little things like that. But on the whole, if you've used Yosemite, uh, El Capitan is going to look very, very similar. You're going to have to, to work hard to find the changes. Uh, most of what you'll see is, is just, oh, it's not so buggy. It works better. It's faster. My battery lasts longer. Um, stuff like that. Um, some of the new features, like the, the split screen view, I, you know, I had to go look up, like, how do you use that? Because it's not obvious. I mean, it's very far from being obvious how you go about using this. So there's some things like that that you'll have to learn. Um, but the good news is y you don't have to retrain yourself. I mean, if, if you got stuff working okay in Yosemite, you can pretty much keep doing the same things and it'll be fine. Joe, uh, one quick clarification, two, two quick questions, and then we'll let you go. Number one, you, you kind of skipped over file vault. Um, yep. any, any reason we need to be concerned with turning on file vault, turning off file vault during the, the upgrade process? Nope. Um, if you... Uh, I mean, I, I obviously recommend File Vault. I've written a book about it. It's fantastic. You, you should have it on. Uh, it's a great idea. Um, you do not have to turn off File Vault before upgrading to El Capitan. Um, there is just one situation. If you are, if you've decided that you don't want to do a, a straight upgrade, you wanna you wanna wipe your disk and do a clean install of El Capitan, and then you know migrate your stuff over from your backup, which is fine if you want to do that. Um, in, in that situation, because you've wiped your drive, it, it will no longer be protected with file vault. And there you'll have a little, a little alert during your installation saying, Hey, you know, I'm noticing that the, the, the volume you're migrating from was protected with file vault, but the new one isn't. So you're going to re want to remember to turn it back on after the upgrade is finished. Um, but if you're just doing a straight in place upgrade, that won't happen. It'll be fine. So, um, uh, yeah, nothing, nothing special really to know about file vault. Second question. And, and this I think is pretty easy because I think our, we already know the answer. Uh, let's just say that at, at upgrade time, well, menu meters won't work. Um, default folder may not work. A uh, couple other utilities you mentioned during the installation process, do they automatically get moved to that incompatible software, uh, location? Well, it's funny you should ask that. Um, so the installer does look for, uh, uh, you know, background stuff, not just regular apps, but like, um, you know, system enhancements, kernel extensions, uh, control panel, control panels. Um, I, I was using Windows recently. Um, <laughs> system preference panes. Um, stuff, stuff that, uh, that, that's on its list of, oh, we know that this particular version of this particular software is, is incompatible. So it'll actually say, hey, I, I moved this for you because it's not going to work where it was and it could cause a crash. So here's a list of the stuff that you need to you know, go update manually. That, that's nice, but it doesn't cover everything. For example, one of the things that feature does not find is GPG mail. So, well, you know, during one of my upgrades, uh, that plugin was not moved aside. When I opened mail, it disabled some plugins, didn't disable that one. And then mail just started crashing. I'm like, but, but my mail plugins are all disabled. Why should mail be crashed? Oh, that one wasn't um, because that one is stored in a slightly different location. So um, uh, things like default folder, 
um, won't be disabled by the installer. Um, it, it's just that they won't work until you upgrade to the new version. So I'm glad the installer disables things that are going to be really crippling to your system, but it does not know about everything, and it doesn't disable things that simply won't work. It only disables things that are going to actively cause serious problems like you know, crashes. Uh, and even then, as I say, not all of them. So um, don't don't count on that too heavily. Got it. Got it. Okay, so folks, what you need to know is uh, you need to know that you need to go get take control of upgrading to El Capitan. Uh, if you're seeing this before September 30th, then you can get a $5 discount on it. And if you're seeing it after, then you're going to pay $5 more for all this great advice. And it is great advice. It's, it's stuff because I've just thrown you a couple things. And it's interesting to watch his head work because uh, you can see, oh, yeah, you know, there there is this maybe little gotcha. So be aware. Yeah. Joe, it's great to see you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. And takecontrolbooks.com, obviously. Right. Uh, it's great to see you. I hope we get to talk again soon and see you on the other side of El Capitan. Fantastic. See you then. All right. Take care. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. We'll be back with more, and I'm looking to uh, forward upgrading to El Capitan. I'm anxious to see how what the adoption rate will be and whether you will be joining us. Until the next time, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the Mac Voices blog. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Do more with your Apple tech by subscribing to the free Mac Voices magazine on Flipboard, by visiting macvoices.com slash magazine. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.